Hello everyone, and welcome to the 29th episode. Today I'll be exploring the Holocene, the most recent geological era, and the world of ancient man. The Holocene is, by far, the shortest of all the geological eras I've covered so far. The first geologic era was the Precambrian, which lasted for the first 4 billion years of Earth's history. For the first 2 billion of these years, the Earth was forming in a chaos of volcanic fire and asteroid impacts. Then the first cells appeared, slowly evolving over the next 2 billion years. In time, some cells integrated with mitochondria, and they became able to produce enough energy to support a more complex internal biochemistry. Some of these cells also integrated with chlorophyll, becoming photosynthetic. Multicellularity was evolved, leading to the Cambrian explosion more than 540 million years ago. During the Paleozoic era, the oceans filled with life of all sorts, from bacteria to plants to animals. Marine ecosystems emerged, and life became increasingly complex. After nearly 75 to about 100 million years, life began its crawl onto dry land. Microorganisms came first, followed by plants and then arthropods. The tetrapods came later, evolving into the ancestors of mammals and reptiles and amphibians. By 380 million years ago, in the heart of the Devonian period, the dry land masses of the Earth were covered in complex ecosystems. Things like giant dragonflies, predatory marine reptiles, and dinosaurs dominated the rest of the Mesozoic era. All until a massive asteroid came and struck the Earth and wiped out almost everything. In the Cenozoic era, which followed the asteroid impact, Birds and mammals emerged from the cold and the dark as the dominant forms of life. In the case of terror birds and saber-toothed tigers, many of these species grew to terrifying proportions, replacing the dinosaurs as the dominant predators in most ecosystems. During the Cenozoic, the world's climate became drier and colder, going through several cyclical periods of glaciation where the polar ice flows reached as far down as 40 degrees latitude by Rome or Tokyo. These changes led to the widespread emergence of grasslands and savannas, the spread of deserts, and the regression of the forests. Our primate ancestors saw the writing on the wall, and they moved out of the jungles and onto the plains of eastern Africa. The early Homo sapiens would spread north out of Africa, going east into Asia and north into Europe. These groups of Homo sapiens encountered populations of Neanderthals in Europe and Denisovans in Asia, groups that had dispersed from Africa thousands of years before and the Homo sapiens traded with them, bred with them, and eventually drove them to extinction by outcompeting them. These Homo sapien populations, these human populations, would continue to migrate, with those in Asia continuing eastward to the coasts. They moved north, through Siberia, and across the Bering Land Bridge, a huge isthmus that connected Asia with North America. The relatively high quantity of water tied up in the glaciers had actually lowered the sea level, and the Bering Land Bridge was exposed for several thousand years. The early human groups migrated across this land bridge and moved south, settling North America and then South America. These migrations out of Africa began around 100,000 years ago, taking another 40,000 years for population groups to fill out the Asian continent. They crossed the Bering Land Bridge sometime most likely around 16,500 years ago, and this finalized the human settlement of all of the continents except Antarctica. All of these migrations occurred at the end of the Quaternary Period, at the very end of the Cenozoic Era. This time period was characterized by a series of ice ages, which saw glaciers creep down the latitudes and massive ice sheets, disrupting ecosystems and obstructing travel corridors. The last of these glacial events began around the same time Homo sapiens began migrating out of Africa. This glacial period would last for about 100,000 years, with glaciers moving down from the poles and peaking in size about 22,000 years ago before receding back towards the poles. The glacial period ended 11,700 years ago, which is the starting point for the Holocene. Because the Holocene is a relatively short period of time, you know, barely more than 10,000 years, and because it's the most recent period in geologic time, the Holocene has been extensively studied. Many samples of plant and animal tissue from the time are well-preserved, which gives us a really informative window into the recent past. This biological material tells us the story of the Holocene, 
revealing a tapestry of extinction, climate fluctuations, and an increasingly profound human influence on the natural world. Because of the short time span of the Holocene, plants and animals didn't really evolve very much, and the continents themselves moved less than a kilometer. The biggest changes in the biology of the planet involved the migration of various species into new areas, including the migration and blending of human population groups and the extinction of species like the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger. The climate fluctuations are an unofficial guide used to divide the Holocene into five blocks of time, each block lasting about one to 3,000 years. In chronological order, these five periods of time are the pre-boreal, the boreal, the Atlantic, the sub-boreal, and the sub-Atlantic. The pre-boreal was the first stage of the Holocene, which saw the global temperatures begin to increase. The world had been cloaked in cold for much of the last glacial period, leaving a world ecology limited by the often frigid temperatures. Much of the northern latitudes were simpler ecosystems, with expanses of grassland and tundra permeated with small animals, grazing mammals, and a, a few larger predators. When the Holocene began with the pre-boreal period, this increased warmth led to the emergence of forests where there was once just grassland. These forests of birch, pine, and aspen trees spread across Asia and Europe. Those animals who already dwelled in the forests, like deers, pigs, wolves, bears, and large cats, all of these animals had their habitats expanded tremendously, and they could radiate outwards across Asia and Europe to find new places to live. Other species, like beavers and otters and various fish, all moved into the waterways and lakes that dotted the surface of Europe. This adaptive radiation created the allopatric and sympatric conditions necessary for divergence and speciation. But because all of this happened so recently, there hasn't been enough time for these early divergences to turn into full-fledged speciation events. In addition to the expanding forests, the shrinking grasslands led to the extinction or displacement of those species that lived there for thousands of years. The boreal period saw humans adapt to the new ecological conditions in Europe and Asia. Many adopted the forests as their new homes, using the woods to hunt for meat and gather foods like nuts and fruits, while fishing in the rivers and lakes for food. The birch and aspen trees that came in the first radiation were accompanied in the boreal period by pine trees and hazel trees, increasing the biodiversity of the overlapping regions. The relatively warm temperatures allowed various species to migrate farther north than they would uh, usually have been able, including tropical plants and reptiles that made it as far north as Denmark and Norway. The early human forest societies were surrounded by ample resources, which encouraged a semi-static lifestyle and a shift of attention towards technological production. To the east, across the rugged lands of Asia, the expanse of the forests pushed the grasslands eastward. Those large grazing mammals that depended on the grasslands for food, they were pushed eastward too, and the human populations that hunted them followed their migration. In time, those groups in central and eastern expanses of Asia had hunted most of their prey to extinction, which forced them to transition from a hunting lifestyle into a herding lifestyle, as they had to manage the remaining populations of ungulates and grazers that they had depended on for so long. Unlike the populations in Europe and Western Asia, these population groups were much more nomadic. Instead of settling in regions of high resource density, they migrated nomadically across huge expanses of land, using temporary structures like the Mongolian yurt for shelter. Around this time, 11,000 years ago, the first true agricultural societies emerged near modern-day Jordan, where they cultivated various cereal grains and figs. This area is part of the so-called Fertile Crescent, a region of land that stretches from the Nile Delta in Egypt to Mesopotamia, a region of modern-day Iraq that sits between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. As the global temperature increased in the pre-boreal and boreal periods, it reached its Holocene maximum in the Atlantic period, which lasted from 7,500 years ago to 5,000 years ago. Because of the relatively warm conditions, the ice caps were small and glaciation was minimal. Because water wasn't tied up in ice, the sea levels were about 3 meters higher then than they are today. Because all things are related, all ecosystems are integrated in the global biome, and so the relatively high water level also increased the general humidity of the atmosphere. This increased humidity and temperature kept the window of opportunity open for more and more plant and animal species to migrate northward. The interactions of the boreal forests with incoming species were highly varied, 
where some regions saw southern species completely take over and all the northern species were wiped out or pushed out, while other regions saw the emergence of mixed forests with a healthy diversity. In general, hardwood tree species like beech, oak, hazel, and alder all crept northward, taking over the softwood pine and birch forests that had moved in several thousand years before. The populations of wolves, deer, horses, pigs, bears, and large cats that had moved north were thriving in the forests, as were a huge range of smaller animals like squirrels, bats, and other ground-dwelling rodents. The dominant bird species in Europe at the time were those that hunted by diving into lakes and rivers to catch fish, enjoying the abundance of food in the numerous waterways of the continent. In a region of Central Europe, between the Danube and Rhine rivers, so kind of around uh, southern Germany and eastern France, a human society emerged that practiced slash-and-burn agriculture. This method involves the literal slashing and burning of forests to clear the land for agriculture. As an early form of deforestation, the slash-and-burn technique was one of the first ways in which humans radically altered their environment, and thus the biogeography of the world around them. By destroying patches of forest, they destroyed all the plants there, and they pushed out all of the animals that lived there. Furthermore, once the land was cleared, it became a suitable habitat for a whole new set of creatures, like those who thrived in the pre-boreal grasslands. This slash-and-burn activity led to a widespread deforestation of Europe by the end of the Atlantic, with most forests and wooded areas reduced to just small regions surrounded by expanses of grassland and really primitive farms. Other human populations in the area at the time were forced to relocate deeper inland, pushed back by the rising sea levels. The Atlantic period has a soft end date. That is, there isn't a hard point where the Atlantic period ends and the subboreal period begins. This is true for pretty much all of these dates and periods, all of the ones that I've referenced in this series so far, because it's near impossible to date an event or pattern to a specific year. That's also because a lot of these events and patterns take place thousands or millions of years ago, so it's understandable that there's a little ambiguity, you know, exactly as to where the start and end dates of any of these particular events are. Anyways, the Atlantic period gave way to the subboreal period. During this time, many lakes across Africa experienced a rapid drop in water level as the aridity caused water to evaporate, but it didn't let that water get replaced. It, there was no rain, so the, the water levels sank, but they never came back up. Around modern-day Greece, a brutal drought savaged the people, plants, and animals that lived there. Other droughts would strike throughout the period, affecting the ancient human societies by starving their crops and pushing the people to migrate elsewhere. The ancient Mesopotamian city of Uruk, of which the modern-day Iraq is named after, is thought to have been brought to its knees by these droughts. As temperatures and humidity dropped, the world's forests and biomes underwent significant change. The forests in Europe, particularly northern Europe, suffered from declining elm and oak populations, which returned dominance in these regions to the softwood birch and pine trees that had originally replaced the grasslands thousands of years ago. Other tree species, like beech and hornbeam, experienced the opposite, spreading out with wild success, often to fill in the places left open by the retreat of elm and oak trees. The lower humidity allowed heath plants, like cranberries and blueberries, to thrive as well, and these spread into Europe and northern Asia. These berries would provide new resources to all of the animals in the region, opening up new niches for them to adapt to, and encouraging the spread of other animals who use those berries for food. Those insects who used the heath plants for food, or those who used the berries to lay their eggs, those insects would have followed the spread of the heath plants into new habitats. These insects underwent their own radiation events, in symbiosis with the radiation of the plants that they depended on. Besides the movement of berries and trees and insects, the subboreal was a relatively uneventful time, followed by the subatlantic period. The trends of decreasing temperature and humidity continued through the subboreal into the subatlantic, where the colder temperatures caused many tree populations like oak and alder to recede, while others, like hazel and birch, persisted in the cold weather just fine. The expanding adoption of agriculture in human societies led to the spread of cereal grains and other domesticated plants, as well as numerous flower species and the associated groups of insects that followed them around. The subatlantic period experienced a few climate fluctuations that had reverberating effects on the world's ecology. 
For example, the sub-Atlantic region began with the Roman Warm Period, which lasted for about 600 years, around the time of the Roman Empire. A brief period of cooling followed, which spurred migration among many affected human populations. For example, it's thought that these colder, drier conditions pushed the Huns, Slavs, and Bulgars westward into Europe, which would have then been a trigger for the migration of Germanic tribes southward into Roman territory and westward into Spain and Britain. It's kind of fascinating to think that the plethora of Roman wars against aggressive Germanic tribes in the 5th to 8th centuries were caused by the tribes being pushed westward by people invading them from even further east. And those people, those people even further east, like the Huns and the Slavs, were themselves motivated by globe-affecting climate fluctuations. It just goes to show you that a seemingly unimportant detail of geologic history could have massive downstream effects on ecology and human civilization. From the perspective of human civilization specifically, the Holocene can be broken up into blocks of time based on our technological advancement. The first 1500 years or so of the Holocene are part of the Old Stone Age, or the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic eras. During this period, and for many thousands of years beforehand, Homo sapiens outcompeted all the other Homo cousin lineages to remain the last lineage in the Homo genus that still existed. During this time, we learned how to fish, how to make cave art, and how to control fire. And we developed the first roots, the first proto-roots of the religious philosophies that would evolve into modern-day Hinduism and Judaism and Christianity. As our primitive technology developed, we changed our hunting tactics. For thousands of years beforehand, Homo sapiens had hunted smaller, easier-to-catch prey like fish, deer, and various small critters like rabbits, birds, squirrels, lizards, and bugs. We gathered vegetable foods from the forests and grasslands like berries, nuts, seeds, tubers, and grains. It was difficult for early man to hunt larger prey like bison, bears, or mammoth until we developed a suitable technology. The ancient Clovis culture produced spears with detachable points carved out of bone. The Clovis hunters would approach a mastodon or a bison or some other kind of huge megafauna and throw the spear. The bony spear tip would stab into the animal, and as the animal bucked and shook as it ran away, the spear shaft falls out of the embedded tip. The hunter could then recover the spear shaft and load another bone tip for another throw, kind of like the world's first semi-automatic projectile weapon. After killing a huge beast like a mammoth or a bison, the meat could last a community for weeks, or depending on their preservation techniques, for months or even years. As human populations hunted these large animals to extinction, the use of detachable spearheads fell out of practice. Other hunting tools remained popular, like the atlatl in Mesoamerica, and later on, the bow and arrow became ubiquitous in a hunter's arsenal. Humans used dogs to help them hunt. The relationship was symbiotic, mutualist. The dogs would help track down and attack prey, as they had a better nose for tracking things and they could move faster than the humans. The humans, on the other hand, would help kill the prey and prepare the meat, and some of the meat was shared with the dogs as a reward for their work. This served as the fundamental basis for the co-evolutionary relationship of man and dog. They were loyal companions who helped us get food, and in return, we'd protect them and give them a little bit off the catch. Everyone benefited, so it was a relationship that was preserved as humans became less nomadic and more agricultural. Human groups had to change and adapt to the changing world around them. Peoples who practice forager lifestyles learn to migrate with the seasons to maximize their available resources at any given time, while those who practice collector lifestyles tended to find a resource-rich area and they would stay there for long periods of time. Those who hunted would do so through a variety of means. They would fish in any nearby rivers or lakes, and they would make regular hunts for small game like birds, rodents, and deer. They would dispatch in small groups to hunt down megafauna like bears and mammoths. The development of organized farming and other advanced technologies brought us into the Neolithic, or the New Stone Age, which lasted from around 10,000 years ago up until around 4 to 5,000 years ago. The Neolithic saw land cultivation become an increasingly dominant means of food production, which supplemented and then, for many people, largely replaced hunter-gathering and pastoral herding as the dominant technique. For the most part, human populations were still largely nomadic, dispersed over sizable regions and connected through trade and shared hunting grounds. But the increasingly popular agricultural techniques led to the Neolithic Revolution, 
which was a large-scale shift in human lifestyles due to the opportunities provided by agriculture. It began several trends. Human agriculture provided an impetus for technological advancement, as more and more sophisticated devices were created to plow the field or grind wheat or what have you. Second, it meant that humans were living in close proximity to farm animals like cows, goats, sheep, and pigs. These animals were a source of meat and milk that would influence our human genome, and they were a source of labor that allowed people to engage in large-scale farming or building. But they were also a source of diseases that mutated to infect human populations. These factors in turn began a trend of larger settlements, permanent settlements with larger populations, and a more specialized division of labor. The Neolithic period came to an end when humans in the Fertile Crescent developed rudimentary metallurgy, or the ability to smelt and craft metal, and this led to a period called the Chalcolithic, or the Copper Age. By this time, people had spread out to every corner of the world, and permanent societies had been established in most regions. The effects of farming were beginning to have widespread effects as the practices spread with human population groups. More land was cleared for farming, which meant that there was less forest for smaller animals, but more grassland for larger grazing animals. You might have heard the name Otzi the Iceman. This guy is a famous corpse who was found preserved in a frozen mountain pass somewhere in the Alps. He's been dead for more than 4,000 years, which means he lived at the very tail end of the Neolithic, in the very early days of the Copper Age. On his person was found several supplies and tools, including an axe made out of copper. In the Americas, particularly in South America and Mesoamerica, there's extensive evidence of copper mining and manufacture, suggesting that these people had independently developed copper technology hundreds or maybe even thousands of years before most other population groups. In Asia, pieces of copper tools and weapons were recovered in the Jingzai and Hongshan cultures, both of which existed in the northeastern corners of China. Similar items were also found in India and Pakistan, Iran, the Middle East, and in parts of Africa. Africa is a little more complex, because individual groups started producing iron while much of the rest of the world was still stuck smelting copper. When it was discovered that tin added to copper could make the superior alloy bronze, the Chalcolithic Age gave way to the Bronze Age, around 3,000 years ago. This period saw the rise of numerous major human factions, like the Babylonians and the city of Ur in Mesopotamia, the Moche and Kalchaqui peoples of South America, the Harapans of the Indus Valley, the Elam, Oxus, and Kuli peoples in the highlands of Iran, the Hittites and Asua in Anatolia, the Amorites in Syria, the Three Kingdoms of Ancient Egypt, the Minoans and Illyrians of the Aegean Sea, and the Shang and Zhao dynasties in China. Many of these societies traded with one another and with nearby but less advanced societies. Just as copper technology had been replaced by bronze, bronze technology was replaced by iron. This transition wasn't immediate, as many societies continued to use bronze long after other societies had discovered how to use iron. The transition into the Iron Age took place across a time span from 3,000 to 2,600 years ago. With the development of iron came the associated technological developments and the emergence of continent-spanning factions like the Roman Empire, the Huns, and various Chinese dynasties. Human populations began to swell as life expectancy increased, and advances in technology allowed people to farm, hunt, build, and wage wars on scales that they'd never been able to before. The impact of human behavior on the world's ecology was really starting to pick up pace, accelerating concurrently with the population growth and the development of greater technologies. Then the world saw the advent of modern medicine, and then industrialization, and then a global population boom of unprecedented magnitude. In the modern day, mankind is a global society with advanced technologies like the internet, genetic modification, and space flight. Our influence on the world's biota really can't be understated or underestimated. Within the last 200 years, our industrialization has had an unprecedented influence on the world's ecosystems. We're destroying habitats, rendering species extinct, and polluting the oceans and the atmosphere at a rate only surpassed by the meteor impacts or volcanoes that induce the other mass extinction events in Earth's history. In fact, our modern behavior has been so destructive to life that it's induced the sixth major extinction event in Earth's history, called the Holocene Extinction. 
Since the 17th century, species have been going extinct at a faster and faster rate due to human behaviors. Animals like Stellar's sea cow, the Maridius blue pigeon, the New Zealand great auk, and the blue buck antelope were all hunted to extinction. Other animals were also hunted to extinction if they happened to provide some valuable resource to the humans who hunted them. The sea mink was hunted to extinction for its fur in 1860, and the only bear species native to Africa was hunted for sport until they were driven to extinction in 1879. Other species were wiped out when their habitats were wiped out. The Hawaiian chaff flower, the string tree, the platypus frog, the huya bird, and a Tasmanian tiger cousin called the thylacine were all wiped out when their habitats were destroyed, either by logging or pollution or some other factor. Climate change is responsible for the extinction of species like the 24-rayed sunstar, the golden toad of Costa Rica, and numerous species who use coral reefs as a primary habitat. Just consider the sheer volume of activities we do that can drastically hurt or alter the habitats and ecosystems around us. Our dredging and burning of oil and natural gas is pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, supplemented by the CO2 released from heavy industry, agriculture, and chemical processing. Activities like mining and fracking will often spill chemicals into nearby ecosystems, polluting them and damaging whatever happens to live there. On a global scale, we barely even try to recycle our plastics, which means millions of tons of plastics are thrown out only to pollute various habitats. Animals mistake pieces of plastic for food and try to eat them, either choking on the inedible material or starving, as these animals will eat plastic until their stomachs are full, as they can't digest it and derive any nutrients, and they'll be unable to eat actual food and they'll just starve. For that matter, most plastic isn't even biodegradable. So when it's thrown out into the wild, it stays there, forever. I'll address all of these problems and more in the next and final episode in this series. In that episode, I'll discuss the Holocene extinction and its ramifications, and I'll explore the future of evolution on our little blue planet. I'll start by discussing how animals and plants have responded evolutionarily to our technological sophistication, and then I'll go on to explore the future evolutionary paths that current species might go down, should they not go extinct due to human interference. We live in a world surrounded by biology, and our collective behaviors and actions have dramatic effects on this biology. We can see this when we look back in time at the Holocene, and we can predict this into the future by seeing how life responds to us now in the present. If this sounds like something you might be interested in listening to, then you should check it out. As for this episode about the Holocene, hopefully you learned something cool about the lives of our ancestors. I hope I was able to paint a picture of the difficult, rugged lives our ancestors lived as they struggled to carve out a place for themselves in a harsh and unforgiving world. As always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 